Michaels Show, starring Joanne Michaels, speaking out on the unspeakable. Tonight's guests include Philip Schatz, senior partner at McCabe and Mack, located in Poughkeepsie, New York. Ernie Townsend, executive director of the Ulster County Mental Health. And the Honorable Ralph Feisner, Supreme Court judge for Dutchess County, New York. And now, Joanne Michaels. I'd like to welcome you to the Joanne Michaels Show. And this evening, I have with me three distinguished guests. Uh, my first guest will be Philip Schatz, who's a senior partner at the law firm McCabe and Mack in Poughkeepsie, New York. And my second guest will be Ernest Townsend. He's the executive director of Ulster County Mental Health in Kingston, based in Kingston. And my last guest will be Dutchess County Supreme Court Judge Ralph Beisner. All three of these gentlemen took time out of their busy schedules to share with all of you some information that is very difficult to get. And I hope you'll stay tuned for the full hour. Um, with no further ado, I'd like to introduce Philip Schatz, and thank you for being here with me today. <laughs> Hello, Joanne. Good to see you. Um, as many of you out there don't know, um, Mr. Schatz and I met because I retained him as my custody attorney six months after my divorce was finalized. Uh, through no choice of my own, I was forced into a custody dispute. And um, we're still talking, as you can see, <laughs> which is good. <laughs> but anyway, thanks for coming. And um, one of the things I think that would be of interest to most people who call me and ask me questions about this legal process that's so arcane, uh, what do you tell clients when they come to you I, uh, for matrimonial cases, specifically custody? What, what is your general advice to them? Well, Joanne, one of the problems, and uh, interestingly, I rode over here with Judge Beisner, and we talked about the fact that so often people get into a, quote, I have to win situation, or they have to uh, raise every difficult issue that went on of 10 or 20 or 30 or one year of marriage, and they lose perspective, and they forget that sometimes uh, the price is too great. Uh, you know, it, it, if you could explain to people that when you get into a fight, the lawyers get paid, the emotional stress that is involved in a litigation, uh, what I call a litigation syndrome, is so damaging uh, to them and to children. If there are children involved, that you, you sometimes say to people, maybe it's better to give more than you think you should because children are remarkably astute and understanding, and if you let them know you care and say, well, I'll surrender a point because it's better for you, uh, it is far better than going to the mat and uh, dragging kids into a judge's chambers and dragging witnesses in and rehashing it, which is just incredibly damaging to children. Right, I uh, agree with you, and I saw that. And uh, some people would be interested in knowing when do you think you can use the mediation process? That's becoming a very popular alternative to litigation. Um, but very often, that's not some, by the time you get to custody dispute, you very often are beyond mediation. But what do you think are some of the, um, uh, well, I think it's a positive thing to be able to use mediation, but do you suggest that to clients? Every uh, client that comes to me on a matrimonial issue, I will counsel them that if they feel it is feasible, and you can almost tell how uh, surface the anger is, that mediation is far uh, des more desirable than litigation because uh, then you don't get so much into the you have to win situation, you're more into a let's solve the problem situation. Uh, interestingly, uh, Pennsylvania now and other states have compulsory mediation before a professional mediator with the hope that you can solve at least some, if not all, of the problems without getting into a situation where, uh, well, with all due respect to lawyers, lawyers' egos get in the way, and they want to win just as much as people want to win, and uh, it, it, it can uh, flare out of control at, at enormous emotional expense and uh, not insignificantly large uh, financial expense. All right. Well, that I know. <laughs> <laughs> Personally, I know. Um, what if, when you've done matrimonials, what do you think are the biggest roadblocks to coming to 
resolution well first of all there's different kinds of custody there's residential and there's decision making custody isn't that correct let me when we talk about joint custody the technical meaning of joint custody is that each person has an equal right to the say so with regard to the raising of the child they have access to the school and medical records they have the right to put their input in as to medical decisions schooling decisions vacation decisions and so on obviously it's very difficult for a child to be three and a half days with one parent and three and a half days with another parent so that even when there's joint custody usually there is a direction for residents to be with one parent or the other although I will say we have two matters in the office now where children are spending exactly three and a half days with each parent that is to say four days one week and three days the next and I'm terribly impressed with how well that is working but in both of those cases you have bright people uh, with marriages that died uh, without combat and there was a recognition that it was uh, important for them both to be good parents and important for them to have a stability and uh, they live in the same school district so that it can work. Uh, that's, I would say, rare, but it can work. I, I somehow feel, I know my son being a teenager, he's told me that it's very common for, for children to live, a, at maybe at that age, in their older teenage years, mm -hmm. to live a week or two weeks with one parent and then switch to the other. That's yet another um, way that, that can work. Um, but the court doesn't mandate that. In other words, the, the parties have to agree to that before they go into court. Isn't no. it generally the court will name one person the custodial parent and one person the visitor? Visiting generally, parent. but Isn't the court will do what it feels is in the best interest of the child. And if uh, a court believes that it is proper and appropriate, <coughs> they may very well uh, give a direction for the child to spend half time with each. Uh, it, that's uh, the courts have very broad discretion and properly so because uh, the judges can hear both sides and uh, when you uh, say more the courts have discretion it seems to me that the judge hearing your case has the discretion yeah Isn't that but correct? I say the courts have discretion because if a judge does something that's uh, not in conformity with the law or not in conformity with uh, a resolution of the facts as they're presented that's what the appellate courts are for and unfortunately good judges make bad decisions on occasion and uh, uh, the reason I guess I like the judicial process is the opportunity to seek redress if a judge has made a wrong call. But very often I, I remember being confronted with these decisions myself and hearing from the public who call me about this especially with custody because you're dealing with your children these matters are judicially legislated that's our system it takes months and sometimes even a year and when you have decisions that are made that somebody has to live with that are unjust or biased or whatever somebody feels are not in the best interest of their children it's very difficult to say it's not just money that's involved it's in custody it's their children so it's these judges you know a lot of people are saying like who are they to tell you how many days they, to spend with your child a week? How do they? How do they know about parenting so well? That, those are the decisions, the life decisions they're making that we are rendering. It's not the courts. It's a person, a man Joanne, or a woman sitting on. I, I hear it's you. It's difficult. You know, uh, give me a better solution. It's like uh, I guess Winston Churchill said about democracy. It's the worst form of government, save all others. Now. Uh, I suppose you could uh, give a husband and a wife each a knife or a gun and say, go settle it, but that doesn't make sense. You have to take someone who hopefully is uh, well-trained and compassionate and has some common sense, and they make the best call they can, and sometimes they make wrong ones. There's no question about it. But uh, it's the best system that we have because I don't know any other way you can resolve it except to have somebody make a decision where a husband and a wife can't. I guess what I'm saying is that the appeal process is filled with tremendous delays and tremendous expenses. Oh, okay, let me back uh, off. You so know. that if you get a negative decision that you feel is, is not in the best interest of your child, 
it takes a lengthy time to appeal it, and it takes a lot of money. It's and even, that's a difficulty. Even worse, the, the typical custody case today is, not, is tried in family court, and it's not tried day on day like a civil trial in the Supreme Court. You get a day, and then you wait a week, or you wait two weeks, or you wait a month. But let me tell you the other side of this, because uh, I, I have just enormous regard for the judge's problems. He's trying a case, and all of a sudden, a problem comes up where uh, there's a sexual abuse by a, a, a step-parent of a parent, or a father of a child, or a mother of a child, or uh, there's a situation of a child out of control. Those things really ha have to take a time precedence because they're of desperate and urgent need. And if you read the newspapers on what can occur if they're not dealt with promptly, the courts are, are in a difficult situation because they are, with all due respects, understaffed. There just aren't enough judges to deal with the caseload. And uh, they're under pressure to move the cases, but they're under equal pressure in their own hearts and souls to do what's right. And that's very important also, uh, actually more important than moving the cases. So that I don't know how you balance it. And I am as upset and as frustrated and as angry when a judge uh, an hour into a trial says, I'm sorry, I've got an emergency, I've got to shut it down, and I've brought an expert witness from Massachusetts mm -hmm. or from uh, God knows where, or I've got a client who flew in from California, mm. and you tell them just it's the way it is. But uh, given the alternative, giving my case precedence where there's the Life physical or death safety or of a child mm -hmm. involved, that's a whole different animal. And uh, unless and until they figure out a system, maybe with a duty judge that takes those. But then again, how do you take a duty judge who knows nothing about it and say to him, this is your problem to deal with today when you've got another judge who's been living with it for two years? Uh, I have no solution except to say it's unfortunate and uh, we could use about twice as many judges, but we're not well, going to get them. Well, one of the problems, too, I feel, is that many of us elect these judges and in our area, it's 10 years for family court term mm -hmm. and 14 years for Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. That's a long time. Yeah. And I think you would agree with me that most citizens know very little about these so-called judges before they sit on that bench. And they are the people making these kinds of critical decisions. Um, it's very disturbing to me. And I didn't think about this because I generally voted party, as many of my friends and colleagues do. Uh, and what I learned from my experience in court is how wrong that can be. And how, in other words, it is, it is imperative that all of us as citizens find out more about who these people are, not whether they're Democrats or Republicans, but who they are and what their values are, if they're going to ma be making these kinds of decisions. Um, and that's something, maybe as a lawyer, <laughs> that you don't really find that critical. I, uh, what do you think? I mean, well, I think that these people should be held up to scrutiny the way uh, a president or senator is in, in our local... You that a lawyer to run for judge has to be nominated by a judicial conference, which is a group of lawyers within his party who will screen him, who will then ask for a recommendation as to his technical competence, and uh, he has to go through that before he can even run. I mean, that's not to say a judge could not run as an independent without that, but uh, the bar associations rate uh, potential mm -hmm. judge candidates as qualified or not qualified. And while uh, occasionally the political establishment will actually run somebody who's not qualified, it's so rare that, uh, generally speaking, the candidates we get are uh, qualified and have been screened by their peers within a judicial conference to uh, uh, recommend them for nomination to the party. Well, what if I told you that there is a judge in family court, and not he, but she, tends to be good with the juvenile delinquency cases, mm. but horrific with the matrimonials. Her talent may be dealing with juvenile delinquents, but not with matrimonials, because people come to the table as, 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 as lawyers, but they also have to come as human beings. And their judgment can often be held in question in that regard. What do you think about that? Uh, I'll say that we are all products of our life experience. 
And in the olden days, when we could uh, sort of pick the judges we went uh, before by delaying cases before the individual assignment system, we learned that uh, people are products of their uh, life experience. For example, in uh, some ethnic backgrounds, uh, there is a sense that the uh, mother should get more money than in other ethnic backgrounds. I mean, mm -hmm. it, 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 to uh, be flip about it, the old story about the uh, Irish person will go to a bar and he keeps his pay and mama will uh, do with what she gets. And in a Jewish family, uh, uh, mama gets most of the money. So if you're representing a your wife, you'd rather have a Jewish judge. If you're representing a your husband, you'd rather have an Irish judge. Obviously not absolute. But you let us watch a judge who's been on the bench for five years, and we can tell what his life experience beliefs are. And it's not that it's a big variance. It might be 10%, but it's his perspective. And uh, today we can't uh, pick and choose like we could, but we do know that uh, by their nature, by the way they've been brought up, or by their decisions on the bench for years, they will make decisions that tilt a little bit toward one or the other. And I'm talking about within the range of fair, because uh, I, I have almost never met a judge that isn't fair, conscientious, and decent. But he still is a product of how he was brought up and what his beliefs are. It's right, so what you're is. saying is that bias is built into the human condition, no matter yeah, what you're that's, doing. that's precisely so, uh, not I, a I understand bias. that, but it's very hard when you're standing before this person and they have your financial, your emotional, and your child's and your psychological well-being in their hands with their little decisions that they're making that now, day. Let me ask you and a if question. they get up on the wrong side of the bed, you may not want to be on the other I side say, of the bed. Let me ask you a question yeah. now. Give me a better solution. I'll t well, I've thought about this long and hard, and that's one of the reasons I'm doing this show. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping to get a, a good deal of input on that. But I think perhaps there should be a smaller, like a three people or a committee of three rather than one judge to make this decision, like a jury thing, uh, where you're not at the um, mercy of one person. Because that person may not like one of the litigants and, and the way they come across. And they're, I think when you have three people, perhaps it might be a little bit easier. Uh, that would also maybe staff things a little better, too. And maybe, maybe some of them would have to work for a little less money. <laughs> well, uh, I don't know. Two but, things. Yeah. Number one, on the less money, today judges are, in my view, underpaid. But on the Well, they make $125,000 a year in family court in Ulster County. And, and that's in Ulster a County, of... that's a lot of money in Ulster County. I, I can tell you it's a lot more. The average uh, family of four is, is a lot less than half of that yeah. in, in terms of income. But uh, that's not true of the average person with a, uh, at least three years of graduate, uh, postgraduate college education. It's probably on the low side. But let me uh, talk about mm -hmm. the other thing you mentioned, which is very interesting. My wife uh, acts as an arbiter for the National Association of Securities Dealers. And all arbitrations are panels of three, where you have uh, two people uh, from, who are not with the securities industry and one person who is on the theory that you get a balance. I think if decisions were made, uh, one judge, maybe uh, one medical professional and one layperson might work out well, but you're not talking about a constitutional uh, change which uh, would be rather hard to do. And the other point I'll make is watching my wife with the scheduling of arbitrations to get three people together at the same time unless they're all working full time in the business it is almost impossible. I mean, they schedule four and five months ahead for uh, preliminary hearings. So that uh, our system's not perfect. Uh, there are judges who I would prefer not to appear before on occasion. But adding it up and subtracting it down, the system works reasonably well with the one exception that there just aren't enough people. And I suppose in the best of all worlds, I would like to see the uh, uh, supervision of judges uh, a little tighter because when you do get one that's not very good, uh, we're uh, stuck for the 14 system, years. <laughs> a little slow to react. Although judges do get defrocked, no. uh, we've seen it happen, and uh, it happens a little more slowly than I might like. But uh, it does. The system works. Well, remember the law grinds slowly, but it grinds fine. I've quoted you on that, Phil. I think that's a very, very good. Quote. <laughs> okay. We're thanks, coming close so to the time. Can yeah. I add one thing? Yeah. If I could give litigants one bit of advice, it would be 
look at the what I call risk reward. What are you paying in terms of cost, financial, emotional, and time for what you hope to gain? And sometimes sacrifice your ego just a little bit because it might be far better for you and far better for your children. And uh, uh, that's the one thing that, that we try to tell people is that uh, the secret is to conclude it at the least cost on a fair basis. And also, I will promise you one thing. A bad settlement is better than a good court decision. Because <laughs> uh, that I, I I'm, I'm not talking about I a term, right. but Joanne, you know that when I, I represented you, I said to you, bend a little. It's not as good as you'll get in court, but is it worth the emotional and financial cost of getting there? And I pr felt pretty strongly that your uh, recognition of that and the judgment you used was very wise. Right, but I didn't want to be there in the first place, Phil. <laughs> I was forced in. I am, anyway, thanks a lot for coming it by. It's nice here. to see you it's on TV see you. instead of in the courtroom. <laughs> really, thanks again. I really Not appreciate it. I know you're a busy guy because you're good. <laughs> anyway, Thank you for thanks the again. Um, hello, I'd like to welcome you to the Joanne Michaels Show if you're just tuning in. And my second guest today is Dr. Ernie Townsend, who is the Executive Director of Ulster County Mental Health. He is taking time out of his busy day to join me. He is retiring uh, within the next week, and he will be moving to Mexico. So um, I'm hoping he'll speak real freely. <laughs> but he, he will answer all my questions, I'm sure. Anyway, welcome. Thanks for coming by, Ernie. Thanks. Really. Um, I guess maybe the place to start is to uh, tell our viewers how you and I met each other. It was a, a quite a, a humorous story in retrospect, but at the time it was well, most disturbing. <laughs> at, time, at the time it wasn't humorous. Right. Uh, y you were... Uh, I was ordered, ordered mandated to... by a family court judge named Mark Meadow, uh, who sits in Sullivan County, um, and was sitting in Ulster at the time to hear my case. Uh, he mandated that um, forensic um, uh, drug and alcohol tests should be um, performed on both uh, parties and um, even though I might add that drugs and alcohol were not an issue in our case but I think this was more of a routine matter and perhaps well maybe you can address that I don't know if that is routine but our lawyers uh, didn't seem to object to it well well you had a mental health evaluation including alcohol and drugs and part of the alcohol and drug evaluation would be to have a urine um, a screen to see if there's any uh, chemicals. But uh, neither one of us charged each other with anything about this. This was purely on the part of the court. W well, yeah, I, I don't know that part. Right. I just entered the I'm picture. Just saying, right, you entered the picture because the court uses the agency, Ulster County Mental Health, to do these tests, and the cost is put to the taxpayers, I might add. Um, what was very nice about Ulster County Mental Health is they have a sliding scale. So the cost of these forensic tests was very reasonable. As I recall, I think they were going to charge me $7, so then I proceeded to go about my mm -hmm. business and give them what they wanted. What was most amusing to me and troubling, uh, amusing now but troubling at the time, was when I went into the ladies' room to do this a woman was following me into the stall and wanted to watch. Now, I have to tell you, going through a custody dispute is humiliating in many respects, but this was the straw that broke the camel's back. So I, of course, would not do it. And I wrote a letter to both my attorney, to you, to the judge, um, basically screaming bloody murder about what a ridiculous thing this was and how I will not do it. Now, that's how we met. Right. <laughs> and, 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 and I have to say, you were most responsive well, to my, re to my uh, um, well, you, you listened and you, you put yourself in my position. I guess you well, were. Yes, and, and then I asked, uh, you know, well, why does it have to be observed? And I was told that, it, you know, any forensic uh, urine screen has to be... Uh, Not you know, in uh, Dutchess County. Uh, I call, just for your information viewers out there, Dutchess County does not mm. require that a forensic test mm. be done with someone observing mm. you. My lawyer actually called and said that I would be mm. willing to go into the ladies' room 
in a robe yeah. with no, you know, to do it so they could search to see I had nothing with me, they still wouldn't relent on that. So that's something unique to Ulster County. Those of you in Ulster County, I want you to remember this. And um, you can get around it, which I did. Do you remember what well, happened? Well, yeah, I just said, well, let's get a, a, a blood test. Well, the judge, what happened was, the judge said, go to the hospital and have uh, it done without, he, 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 he backed down, actually. And, but it cost me, and this is what's interesting, mm. $150 not to be humiliated. So in other words, for those who have the $150 or who right. feel it's worth spending it, not to be humiliated, you can. But I felt it was not fair that I had to spend $150 not to be humiliated. And I felt that this was something I always wanted to address publicly. Mm -hmm. And now I have my opportunity. Yeah. So maybe, obviously, they're using, the courts are using your agency for this kind of testing. And I'm sure I'm not the first person. Well, no, I, I think the problem is, is... Maybe I'm the first person who objected to doing it. Well, well I, I think, and I, as I recall, I actually told the judge what, you know, like, uh, what to do. That we could just go, you could just go and have a blood test. I think the problem is, is that it gets so litigious, the whole family court, and, uh, and people do use the mental health department. Lawyers will ask an evaluation for all members of the family. And, and the department is really put into the situation of always responding to whatever the wants are in the family court. And as the previous speak, speaker said, if we could get things in mediation before it gets to the point of where everybody's accusing one another uh, of this. Uh, and, and I think we do use mental health evaluations too, uh, too freely. But on the other side, uh, <coughs> it's been known that in the, uh, when these, courts are, uh, when these uh, decisions are appealed, uh, if there is not a mental health evaluation, then what happens, it's you know, sent back to the court for one. So the appellate division is actually looking to see if a mental health evaluation was done. Um, so, uh, Is there any chance that there could be a liaison between your department and the court oh, oh, saying, this, oh. saying this? I mean, this is re because what I'm seeing is the taxpayers of Ulster County paid for a lot of ridiculous nonsense in my case, and I paid as well. Mm -hmm. and, and I was um, absolutely floored at the waste of time, energy, and money. Because there are people there dealing with very serious problems who have to address uh, nonsense of, of litigation. It's, it's been an exponential growth uh, for uh, demands for uh, evaluations. Uh, when I first came to Ulster County, uh, we actually... Uh, what year was that? Uh, 12 years ago, <laughs> 1988. We, we actually dismantled the whole children's services just so we could do family court evaluations. And we straightened that out. We got some you know, people in, started to do more evaluations, and were able to provide some services. But the demand for evaluations has just been going through the roof. It's one of our most costly uh, services. And it, interesting, it's one of our few mandated services. The law mandates that we do this For those service. people who are not familiar with this, um, when you go into any kind of litigation, they, the court appoints a forensic psychologist, usually, isn't that correct, to evaluate the, the parties. The ch they interview the children. I mean, I had this done. Right, the, um, the court will send the evaluation request to us, and then we will contract out either with independent psychologists or with psychologists who works for the right. department. Now, in my case, there was a gentleman named Stephen Silverman, who was excellent, by mm -hmm. the way. I have only the highest regard for him. Who paid his bill? We did. OK. When you say we did, is that the taxpayers the of the county? Yes. OK. Well, the taxpayers of the county and the taxpayers of New York Can State. Can you give me a rough figure on what it would cost for an evaluation of a husband, a wife, and one child? It will cost at least, uh, I think, around $600. Per person? No, that's for the family. For the family. Yeah. Because when I... But, but know, uh, then again, we, we don't pay the full freight. You know. I was just going to say, because I paid 700 my ex paid 700 when this was done 
a time before, and or someone said it was like something like right. over fourteen hundred dollars. Yeah, we contract with a certain number of psychologists, and therefore we say, well, if you want to do business with us, you know, yeah, yeah, we have a lower rate. Um, yeah. So we we get a volume discount, if you will. And the <laughs> the other thing that's quite disturbing, as you know. Um, uh, Mr. Roach, who was the head of social services and retired uh, about a year or so ago, I interviewed him. Uh, he told me that two out of three abuse charges filed in our county, Ulster, are filed by angry spouses, men and women, mm. that they are proven to be totally false. So his agency, two-thirds of the time in that department, was investigating nonsense, right. by and large. And, and the one-third that were valid probably got short shrift, I mean. Well, well yeah, and, and I think if we did more with mediation, then, then we could really devote the mental health resources to either mediation or for those very, very difficult cases that need some, you know, professional intervention. But what's the roadblock to doing more mediation? I, I, I think, you know, we have to, uh, I think you have to take your crusade to the state legislature and just change it. There are models. I know people have come up to me and says, why don't I change it, you know, as a mm -hmm. department head? Well, you know, uh, I have to act within the confines of the law. However, there's nothing to say that people can't go to the legislature and say, look, we need a new way of, uh, you know, peeling this apple. This is just too difficult. It's too much of a strenuous process for wives, for husbands, for children. And it's really, it get, it's getting to a point where it's a no-win situation, uh, you know, uh, exactly. Yeah, and no matter who <laughs> makes a decision, you know, like you were saying before, well, the, the decision uh, that, that was made against me is wrong. I've heard it from, you know, on a father's end, and no one is really happy with the way the process is working because, you know, they're really in this situation where someone has to win, and I think everybody's losing. So I think we, we go to the state legislature and we say, look, we, we have to do something better. People have to be in mediation. How is this done? I've noticed at election time, you never hear, the divorce rate is over 50%. Has anybody out there heard legislators saying, I want to tackle family law issues. Nobody touches this. It affects everybody. Everybody, even the happily married, are affected because their sons, their daughters, their friends. Why hasn't anybody touched this issue? Well, well, because no one will touch it unless they're presented with it. We had a similar si situation in the mental health field. We had these large state institutions where all the money was going, and most of the patients were in the community, and we weren't getting the money. And, finally, and no one was touching the issue. Uh, Mario Cuomo once said, uh, uh, you know, uh, well, the uh, mentally ill, it's in a sexy political constituency. So he wasn't going to do anything. And then family members, professionals, patients themselves went up to the legislature and said, look, something has to change. And then they passed this reinvestment bill about seven years ago that every time the state hospital, you know, closes so, so many beds, so much money has to come into the community. And I think what you have to do is you have to get all these people who have been affected and just go up like everyone else, you know, from January to March in the and lobby and just go in there and tell your story. Because if they heard your story, they would see that something has to be done. And I think that's the critical thing. You have to, and they will listen then because you will go and you will walk into their offices. <laughs> and you say, you know, like here I am. And then you have, you know, some parents and some children talk about what happened. And you will see the law change. It may take one or two years, maybe three years, but it will change. And I think, you, you know, you have a lot of energy. And I think, you know, the first three months of every year should be devoted to going up to Albany and, and lobbying the, the state legislature because they have the power to change the law. The other question, of course, is, and, and a very uh, crafty lawyer said this to me once in the halls of family court. He said, you know, you can spend all the time and energy you want changing the law, but if someone wants to get around it, they're going to get around it. And I think that has also been a problem. The spirit of the law has been positive. I mean, they, the, the, you know, but when you go to court where the reality is anything but fair very often, and, and to mm -hmm. many people. So that's the shocker for people who are entering the system for the first time. They think if they have a reasonable case and they are reasonable people and they have 
reason for their their case and their cause that there they will prevail or they will at least be heard and what is so shocking and the reason that you're here today and i'm doing this is that that is the person i found with the money and the time can drive the system whatever system it is whether it's a legal system your system that's what is so in america is so frightening to most citizens like myself and I, I'm wondering, I think your, your suggestion's well taken, let's go up and lobby, but I'm wondering if we spend all this time changing the laws slightly to help, is that really going to well, help? Uh, is it, we have to change who we're electing to be judges, the people whose judgment is being exercised, well, is what I see as critical. Well, I, I think it's, it's both. I think there's, a, in, in a democracy, there should be vigilance. You know, in, in other societies, uh, you know, decisions are made that's arbitrary and capricious, and these are open for reviews. But I, I think it's critical to really go to the legislature and, and change the law. As I understand, mm -hmm. family court was supposed to be this informal way user of, friendly. you know, user-friendly yeah. way of solving problems. But as it got more uh, litigious, the process, mm -hmm. as people started appealing more, as uh, appellate divisions, re you know, requested almost similar rules of evidence, uh, that that has become almost as as bad as going through through the regular courts. So, but I, I think mm -hmm. y you know we have to, we have to get out of uh, that. And uh, uh, I, I know I one time I sat in family court. I, I asked uh, when I first got here because we were getting inundated with all these requests. And I asked the judge if I could just sit in on her calendar to see what was ha you know why these requests were coming to my office to see if we could give her what she needed as opposed to what she wanted. And I sat there and, you know, one time, you know, I'm looking and uh, obviously this one lawyer wasn't prepared and, and uh, the, <laughs> the, the, the mother had a lawyer, the father had a lawyer, and then there was uh, a guardians uh, who were appointed for each kid and one wasn't prepared and just looked and he said, well, I think we need an evaluation uh, uh, for this family. And there was, I, I think, three or four kids. So that, w that was uh, uh, three evaluations. And at that point, we did mental health, alcohol, and drug abuse separately, mm -hmm. and for the mother and father. So that triggered off 15 evaluations, <laughs> uh, you know, right before my eyes. And I said, well, you know, something should be done. And that, that's when we combined everything into one evaluation. Uh, but again, you know, w we, we lessened the demand, but it, then it kept increasing. But I think if you want something different, and uh, the legislature is the way to go, and they're, and they're very responsive, uh, you know, once they hear the need, and once they hear from the people who've gone through the system, I think that's Well, really there's good. certainly uh, a large number of people, since I've been doing this television show, and even before uh, I began, uh, I would say I get a few calls every week. Um, I'm, I thought, I only knew my own case. I had no idea mm -hmm that it was volumes, that, that if, if this is any indication of what's going on, it's frightening. Um, and I don't think our county, maybe our county's worse in Ulster, I don't know, than the rest of the country. I think it's a national problem. I think it's national. I think we're doing a very good job in Ulster. But I think if you, you know, you have some issues that are systemic issues that have to be addressed. And keep all the people's names, put them on a Rolodex. I have a website soon. And, and, and you know, have a day when you go up to Albany. That's a great idea. Well, I'm glad that you came up with this. Well, but you're going to Mexico. I'm going to Mexico. And you're going to have the sunshine and the beach. <laughs> you don't have to deal with this. Well, I'm going to be in the mountains. But oh, the mountains. Well, mm -hmm. that's nice, too. Well, listen, it'll remind you of the Catskills. I hope you'll come back to visit. I, I'll come, I know you definitely live in come Woodstock, back. you Woodstock, where, um, where I live. And mm -hmm. I've seen you in town. And mm -hmm. you'll miss it, I know. Yes. <laughs> anyway, thanks so much for coming by. Thank and you. And for shedding light on some of these very complex and uh, bewildering problems. <laughs> anyway, good luck and Thank have, you a, very have much. a very good retirement. You deserve it. Welcome back to the Joanne Michael Show. I'd just like to tell those of you joining me now that my last guest is the Honorable Ralph Beisner, who is a Dutchess County Supreme Court judge, and he was good enough to come here today to answer some of my questions and many people's questions about the workings of our court system. Um, Ralph, thank you for coming by. I appreciate it. Um, I guess the big question to ask you is, 
how do you sleep at night? <laughs> Very well. Okay. Well, I mean, you go home, you've made decisions about other people's lives. You know, you're sitting down at the dinner table, and you just decided who's going to get custody of some children. And, you know, I mean, that's, I wouldn't want your job, I have to say, honestly. So uh, the Issues of custody are probably the most difficult uh, emotionally for anyone. I mean, uh, just because you're a judge doesn't mean you, you can completely disengage yourself from the emotion of the issues that you're deciding. And you're absolutely right. Uh, you, you make a decision that are going to affect not only the, the lives of the two litigants, but the innocent life you might say, of the uh, children that are before you. And it's a, it, it, obviously it's something that you, all judges, I think, consider it, weigh on it, but you make the best decision that you're trained to make within the, the rules of law that you, as you understand them. The, well, you've been the doing measure this a there is, time. you have to remember, the measure there is always the best interests of the children. Mm -hmm. It's not the best interests of the parent, it's the best interests of the child. And you have various sources t uh, to draw upon in order to make that decision. Okay. I, I think, though, that you get what is presented to you either through lawyers, because, and, and sometimes it may depend on the strength of the lawyer who's representing the two parties. I mean, that that's is, what's it's, frightening. It's, it's an adversarial system. Our, our system of justice is an adversarial system. I was, I was speaking with, with uh, Mr. Schatz, your earlier guest, about that on our way over today. The American system of justice is adversarial. It, it, it comes out of trial by combat uh, hundreds of years ago. And, and so we have two sides uh, presenting their case, in a sense, fighting. Uh, and, and then it's the judge's responsibility to, to make sense out of that and to rule one way or the other. Uh, that's why he said it, and I would, I would agree. Nine times out of ten, it's better if the people can somehow be reconciled to both of the parents to look at what's in the best interests of the children and not their own selfish interests as to, I want time with my child or I want to be able to have input on medical decisions or, right. or education decisions just because I'm his parent. The fact that they're the mother and father never changes. That doesn't change because the judge says the child's going to live with the mother or the child's going to live with the father. The other person remains the parent. The child is entitled to know that parent and to have the uh, affection and input and support of that parent. And the judge understands that, and, it, and that's the purpose of visitation. So often, uh, parents use children as, as some kind of a prize in this contest. And that's the thing that we want to avoid. At, if it's at all possible, the judicial system and the judges try to avoid that. They try to impress on the people take a step back and take a look at what you're doing for this child and what's in the best interest, the okay. true best interest. In taking what you just said, let me give you a real basic case. Two gentlemen friends of mine have visitation. They're the visitors. Their ex-wives have custody. Both of these women refuse to vaccinate their children. Now, these gentlemen are very, very disturbed about that because they feel it is not in the best interest of their children not to be vaccinated in the year 2000. Now, so they don't have any so custodial. Because right. they now, if one of them takes the child to a doctor and has the child vaccinated, they could be um, put in jail or, or arrested or whatever you want to say if the wife, uh, ex-wife, uh, filed charges. Now, that to me is one of these things. What you're saying sounds good, but the realities of people's lives include issues like this. Now, what, now then people have to spend money, these guys have to spend money to go to court to force a decision from a judge on whether a child should be vaccinated. Now, because that parent has had custody since day one, or is the custodial parent, their input is disregarded, but the child could get tuberculosis and die in the meantime. Oh, what I'm asking you is, how does something like that 
dealt with. This, by the way, is a common thing. I live in Woodstock. There are people who do not vaccinate their children. There are a lot more than think. Well, at some <clears throat> point in the process, early on in mm -hmm. the process, either by agreement between the parents or by order of the court, one of the parents became the custodial right. parent and had the right, has the right but the responsibility to make the decisions concerning the health and the general welfare of the child, education. But this is life-threatening, in their view. Okay. If, if it is, then the only way, because they are, not the non, they are not the custodial parent, they would have to seek the intervention of the court in order to convince the court that it's in the best interests of their child to have this vaccination. That's what the court process is there for. That's the purpose. I mean, otherwise, uh, the non-custodial parent runs up, grabs the kid, takes it to a doctor, gets a shot, and then gives it back. You, that's, that's the law of the jungle, and you can't have a civilized society. But what you were speaking about was the good of the child, the child's welfare, the health of the child. When one of these children, I know for a fact, was taken to a third world country, and the child wasn't vaccinated. I mean, it, there's just, how, I mean, what would you do in that case? Wouldn't you feel that it was worth going to jail to make sure your child lived? I mean, I don't know. Well, I, I mean, these know, are the, questions. The court really I, can't put itself in the position I of one of the litigants. I understand that, but th that's why these decisions are so hard to litigate. Absolutely, because, because you're in an area where everything is so subjective. You know, the, there's so much in, emotion involved between the parents of a child. There's a, a great deal of emotion involved on the part of a child. Have you ever seen teenagers that come from broken homes and they haven't reconciled, they feel abandoned by, by one of the parents or the other, and they haven't reconciled that, that emotional problem? These are issues that, that are not black and white. They're not cut and dried. You, there's no cookie-cutter mold that can be applied to these kind of issues. It's a very subjective thing. The, what the court and the system try to bring to it is some degree of objectivity to the extent that it's possible so that at least somebody is making an objective decision uh, with regard to the best interests of the child. So m perhaps the person seeking the vaccination is going off half-cocked on, on strange uh, medical opinion, too. Maybe that's not in the best interest of the child. That has to be completely brought out. Both sides have a right to make an input on that. I know on, on, at first blush it would seem to you, gee, how can anyone ever, ever say that that's not in the best interest of a child? We don't know. I don't know the history. I don't know the medical history of the child. I don't know the circumstances of it. There, there's Ralph, this I know what you're saying. And I'm sure that you're a very even-handed judge because you listen to both sides. I'm not saying, but I think that these kinds of, well, we could argue about this for an hour. Right. And that's why this whole, um, this whole system is uh, dealing with these kinds of life issues. To me, it's almost like it it's just doesn't work. Um, one of but the it things, does work. I, I have to disagree. It works it in work. some cases, I, I guess. You, I, I guess I don't get calls from those people and you don't hear, you know. Well, the people that are happy, I mean, that's the one problem with any democracy. The people that are happy don't make complaints. But what about <laughs> capital punishment? You know, you have to say, what about if, if a few innocent people are killed every year? Well, you're getting rid of, you know, you have to say that a lot of people, and I'm not, I don't, there's no way to really, um, well, I guess you can say there's certain, I think there's like 100, over 100,000 um, contested divorce, you know, they, whatever the statistics are, and out of that, so many go to trial, 60,000, I believe, in New York State each year. Um, what I guess is very frightening to people who have never been to court is whether the judges believe a lot of uh, lies that are filed in the court, uh, untruths, exaggerations, and it's very frightening. I mean, you sit there, and I'm sure you read these things, I hope you do, with a grain of salt. But there are certain things that people are accuse each other of in these matrimonials. And when it first happened to me and other people who call me and, and tell me, it's, I, it, do you think this is a function of, like you say, of the adversarial system? The lawyers tell the, the litigants to come up with whatever they can and then they add lace curtains to it? No, most, most attorneys don't do that. They're, but obviously there are abuses in the system. It's a system of rules by man, and there are going to be abuses in it. But that doesn't mean the system doesn't work. You have to try to, 
to take out the individuals that abuse the system and see through that, but the system still works. It is an adversarial system, so allegations are made, but the person making the allegation has the responsibility of proving that allegation. So, mm -hmm. so they have what we call the burden of proof, and, and there are built-in checks and balances throughout the system. But the, one of the problems also is bias on the part of the judges. Sometimes when judges, they read this, for instance, I remember very clearly a lawyer saying to me when a judge was assigned to my case, oh, he's this, this is how we have to proceed because we have this judge. Now, that's scary to somebody who's going in there for the first time, you know, and those are the kinds of, um, in, in theory, what you're saying sounds like the way it should be. But New York Magazine did a very well um, researched article on divorce lawyers and judges. And they stated how certain, one was a woman judge who was very biased against men and had consistently filed against men. And when the lawyers had a male client, they didn't want to get this judge. You know, I mean, look, a lot of women were upset there were no women in the system. Let me tell you, there are a lot of women in the system and it ain't any better. Um, I have to say that this was frightening when I read this article. So bias is a real problem and that's one of the reasons people aren't satisfied or they have to keep appealing because maybe not all these judges are well, as even Well, you handed. just mentioned that. I mean, there, is, there are checks, again, there are checks and balances within the system that would allow those sort of aberrations to be minimized, primarily the appeal process, where it would go between a panel, before a panel of five judges who would review what happened in that case and make a balanced decision. Mm -hmm. So if there was an abuse of, of the perspective, and uh, there, are a ch there is a check and balance in there. But again, you know, this, the system of justice is not a matter of sticking, if you present point A and point B, you're always going to come up with C because then you don't need a judge, you don't need a compassion, you don't need an objectivity, you don't need a subjectivity, all you need is a machine. And, and are we gonna reduce our, our, is that justice? To re always come up two plus two equals four? It doesn't work that way because sometimes two plus two, as strange as this might be for some of your viewers, there are systems where two plus two has to come out to something other than a four because you're never sure that the two that got put into it is two. It might be one and three quarters, it mm -hmm. might be two and a half. You know, so you're, 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 you're coming out and it's the judge's job to come up with the right formula. That's a very difficult I job know. to do. Well, you've been doing it for 16 years, is that correct? Right. About 16 years. So you were a young man of 39 or 40 when you became a Supreme Court judge, is that yeah, correct? That's right. I, which means I'm not young anymore. <laughs> You're a young man in your 50s. <laughs> As I'm getting older, 50s young, 50s young. What do you think, after sitting on the bench for 16 years, what do you think, as you've gone through this process, that you feel you've learned about try? I mean, what is it that's turned your head around? I mean, I'm sitting here after five years of going through these litigations, and I have certain conclusions, but you see it from that perspective. What do you think? Um, I think have you changed in the way you see all this? I mean, obviously, you, it's been an education. To some extent, yeah. I think uh, very, one of the, I think the courts have to do a better job of going out and explaining exactly what the courts can do, what their limitations are and what their good points are, because I think the public's expectations, very often the litigants' expectations, are, are out of kilter to what is possible in a court. We didn't create the bad marriage. We didn't create the child abuse. We're, we're ha having to deal with it in an imperfect world and in an imperfect setting. So we have limitations. We can't make all the harm of our society go away. We can't repair the relationship between a, a father and a, and a child or but a mother and a child. But do you feel more adept at doing this or do you feel more inept? Do you feel in seeing all this over 16 years, do you feel it's easier for you to make these decisions or more difficult because you're aware of all the complexity? I, I, I don't think I can quantify it as easy, uh, is more difficult or easier. I think you, each case is so unique and each case brings its own emotion 
uh, to it that you just have to deal with it on a case-by-case -case basis and bring the best you can to each case. So what do you do in your free time? I play golf. <laughs> Every once in a while I try to write a book. Well, this is good. We're going to look for your book. Okay. I, I think you're a good judge and you'll probably be a good writer, too. Um, thanks, everybody, for joining me. And uh, thank you, Judge Beisner. My it's pleasure. always interesting to hear what you have to say about our wonderful system. I guess it is wonderful because where are we going to go? To Cuba right. or Russia? I don't That's know. Right. I'm wondering. I'm not moving to Mexico. <laughs> right, Ernie. I didn't want to say anything to him, but I wouldn't want to be in Mexico if something went wrong. That's right. You have to have a lot of money to pay off the right people. Um, anyway, thank you for joining me, and I will look forward to you joining me in future weeks, because we have a lot of interesting guests planned, like the three gentlemen who joined me today. I guess I should have more women on my show, but, you know, hey, the best are the best, whatever sex they are. Thank you.